Um, we're very fortunate to have Jens Hoffman, exhibition maker, uh, writer, <coughs> busy man, join us today. Uh, Jared's flying back to Dublin, back home uh, later this evening, so we're very lucky to have these two people in the same place at the same time to talk about Jared's new work in our time, uh, which is at our 10th Avenue space until December 22nd. Um, I don't want to give too much away, so uh, I'll hand over to you guys. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the uh, introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming. I kind of feel like on a, on a Saturday at 10, sounds very civilized, but as I just told you, I still had to, my, uh, to drag myself out of bed, even though it's just... Like it's a little harsh. It's a little harsh. And usually I do these morning talks at 8 o'clock, you know? Okay. So that's... Uh, oh, God, like going to the gym. Anyway, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to uh, um, talk to you about, well, I guess the latest work, but you know, hopefully also some of the other pieces that you've sure. done in the past, because obviously there's a strong relationship to many films that yeah. you've done previously, and your I interest in, in history and a, a particular period. And um, so uh, let's just see. I saw the film for the first time in Münster, and that sculpture project, Münster. And one of the fascinating things about Münster to me is that um, unlike many other large-scale exhibitions that took place this summer, it's really the only one, I think, where every artist is doing a new commission, right. which is so rare yeah. uh, these days. And I just wanted to, to maybe hear you talk a little bit about the process of uh, how did uh, Kasper Koenig, the curator, and the team approach you. And one of the things I never, re I never really understood, why was this film shown in the public library basement? Because I couldn't really make the connection between yeah. the film and... I mean, okay, obviously it's a cultural center, and, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, so Casper approached me about uh, a year and a half before the show. So Münster happens every 10 years, so everybody thinks you have 10 years of lead in. <laughs> 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 okay. so, um, so yeah, he approached me about a year and a half before. They already probably had a fairly well established list of artists at that point, but I never actually worked with him before, but we had sort of friendly relations. I'd met him loads of places and you know, there was a general kind of positivity, but uh, I think actually what triggered it was that I did a, a talk, an artist talk in the Kunst Academy in, in Munich and he happened to be in Munich at the time, and he came to the talk, and then he approached me after the talk. And, um, and so then, I had never seen Münster, I'd never been to a previous edition. So uh, about a month or so later, I went and made a visit to Münster for the first time, and yeah, it's kind of a, a small university town, uh, very kind of, um, uh, you know, quite bourgeois, quite yeah, yeah. But uh, and in a way that that was a little bit challenging. That was a little bit off-putting because you know you just realise these spaces are just very difficult to unlock at certain levels. Uh, and then of course there's an incredible history. You know, the the project has an incredible history, and and that's quite kind of concretely evidenced because you cycle around and you see all these incredible historical works that are still there um, and so um, yeah so I was a little bit I struggled a little bit with it and then and then I got very pragmatic about trying to find a space that's that becomes a and develop a project at the same time and um, developing they both had sort of um, setbacks at various points um, it turned out that actually you I would have I made the assumption that the sculpture project had some sort of like um, um, kind of um, master key that they could unlock any space in Münster for their access, which you would kind of think because for people like us from the <laughs> artistic world, the sculpture project is the big thing in Münster, right? Yeah. But it turns out that actually it's, it's as difficult as anywhere, right? And so it was quite a battle to find a space. And, um, 
And in the end, the, the library space opened up quite late. Uh, I had said earlier on, like, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, library, so maybe there's a space somewhere in a library or something like that, just throwing a dart, like, kind of, you know, speculatively. But then one of the one of the people working, like one of the sort of assistants, found this space that was quite unknown actually in the base, but it's yeah. a rehearsal room. So people who know about it know about it and they use it, they go in, they rent it, it's very cheap. If you want to practice your 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 clarinet or your violin or something, you can rent the space for two or three euro an hour from the library and you can go in and it's sort of soundproofed and you can practice your noisy musical instruments. And so it's great and it's a wonderful kind of um, it's a wonderful manifestation of a kind of, of, of German social democracy, right? Some sort of idea that, that, that the city should provide such a space for people to practice their musical instruments. <laughs> I love that, you know? It would seem impossible today, but when, obviously when it was built. So then the space, you know, had a lot of attributes that, that seemed to fit the project I was developing. And there was other aspects of it that were kind of, as you say, forced or difficult are shoehorned because it's actually as we discussed earlier it's quite a small space it's yeah, smaller it's than the space we're in now of this space, right? yeah so and it's interesting it's also like somewhere in the basement and like hidden very yeah. very far away yeah. similar to the theater here mm -hmm. um so once you were approached this pr the, the film is extremely particular mm -hmm. in, in in like its setting mm -hmm. I, I also well, struggles maybe the wrong word, but I couldn't also really understand why did you decide to make this piece for for this space for this, for this space, show for that show in Münster. <coughs> yeah, I mean it's also interesting that a film is part of a show that's actually dedicated to outdoor sculpture. Yeah, so so it's interesting. Like when I did the talk that time in the Kunst Academy in in Munich, I talked about a work that I had just finished, which was uh, another film-based work that was um, actually very much about a specific building. It was essentially a film about a building. Um, uh, it's a building in Stockholm, and I just finished the project, and it was very sort of current for me. So I spoke about that, and then when Casper approached me, I think his rationale was like, here's somebody who's made a film about a building. Maybe they can make a film about a building in Münster. Do you know what I mean? As a way of kind of, I think that was his kind of, the way he was thinking through it. So part of, like, as I say, when I went to Munster, I, that was at the back of my mind. Maybe I can find a building to make a film about it. And, um, but I couldn't. Um, and so, um, uh, so then I, I kind of, I suppose at that point, I realized that, I've had a long-standing interest in radio, and I've done other things related, like film work related to radio. I've touched on the idea in other works previously. And, um, and so, um, so it was a lot of it circumstantial. It's time and place. You know, I have these ideas that feel kind of current to me at the moment that I feel like I can work on. I have, you know, a situation that can support that. Yeah. And so on, uh, it's very pragmatic on some level. Yeah. Uh, and then you're trying to make it make sense in that sen the context. The one thing that I will say is that actually the unlikely scenario of a sculpture project as a context for this film work to me is not so unlikely. Actually, I really do think of the work in those kinds of terms on some level. Like the, you know, so for example, you know, even the way I've been installing these projected works for a long time now I've projected I've installed them on kind of freestanding structures now I'm not going to overplay what that means but there is a sense in which at least it's taken off the wall yeah. and put it put into space <coughs> and there's some sense that you encounter it in a spatial way yeah yeah so well, has everyone seen the film at the gallery yeah so you kind of realize also, of course, that it's a very spatial experience, <coughs> you know, and, and particularly through the, the sound yeah. uh, installation that is so specific, it really becomes a kind of immersive environment that, yeah. you know, maybe relates more to like a sort of idea of sculpture and an expanded notion of sculpture mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, li well, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the film itself mm -hmm. and... Um, where the idea for that emerged. Like you have yeah. a sort of history of making films where 
something that's actually usually not visible mm -hmm. sort of becomes visible like mm -hmm. you know you never really see the background of a radio station mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you you yeah. never really see people sitting around the table and actually doing a conversation yeah about uh you know, yeah, the future of the yeah. world when you have like <laughs> sci-fi writers, uh, and but then yeah. you know There's the transcription like is like realized yeah. in some way. And yeah, that that's actually a really a really good kind of um, uh, sort of sampling in a way because that is one of the things like like when I I was just referring to another 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 no, piece no, that you made which is yeah. a trans well, it, reading a, a transcription of a conversation between like Ray Science Bradbury, who writers, else yeah. was there? <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke, yeah. Asimov, like a and, whole and strangely whole enough, this was like in in Playboy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. in the sixties. Yeah. So in the sixties. I mean, certainly. I mean, what I like about what you've just touched on is that actually, when I go to make, you know, take a film camera to sort of film something, I do at some level ask myself questions about what is the what's what is the, what is the significance of the gesture of filming this. So I don't use the camera as just some sort of default acquisition medium, you know, like a fisherman with a fishing rod, right? Just uh, with a net scooping <coughs> things up. I mean, I, 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 there has to, I have to have a sense that there's, that there's something latent in the scenario that, 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 the, that the camera can draw out that couldn't be otherwise drawn out. Do you know what I mean? So on that level, there's a gesture in. And in this case, as you said, I mean, as you touch on, there's a basic kind of perversity, which I like. There's a basic perversity in the scenario of making uh, a, a, a film, a visual study of a radio broadcast. Because it's something that, of course, isn't made to be, you know, to, to, it, it, there's no, there's no, it isn't made to be visualized. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As a scenario. So, so that's, that already kind of opens out a type of space. <coughs> You know, and and then after that, then um, sort of you work. You know that there's space to work in within that part, within that sort of range. You know, so um, yeah. So that gesture that you uh, yeah. apply there, making something sort of visible that is otherwise maybe um, uncovered um, mm -hmm. or, or it is covered, covered. Um, also makes all the work seem somewhere to sit between fact and fiction or mm -hmm. like some space that is kind of like mm -hmm. the, you know because you never see this other part mm -hmm. even though it is actually exists mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. sort of like something that I find very interesting mm -hmm. also about this film mm -hmm. in terms of how it jumps between mm -hmm. different places different mm -hmm. um, times mm -hmm. and what is the time span of the radio announcements uh, well actually it, it the, the, the references roughly scatter between Probably the late '60s and the mid '80s. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there, are, you know, so if, like, I mean, th it's interesting because, you know, there's always a set of there's a set of questions have accompanied the showing of this work, which often involve uh, which revolve around the idea of the period, like what's the period, yeah. you know, and and of course that's a that's an anxiety that comes out of film production, you know, mm -hmm. and and it's something that I. I, I'm interested in it, but it's not something that I, I succumb to, if you know what I mean. There's a certain kind of, uh, there's a certain license I take, the fact that it's an artwork. Uh, somehow I give myself license to, to not necessarily follow the rules at these, at certain moments. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, I, you know, I, I think what's one of the things that's tricky about these kind of things is that there's ways in which they perfectly mimic the, the, the aesthetics and the kind of aesthetic and production rules of film production and then uh, and, and filmic naturalism and then on another level there's ways in which of course they they flout those rules they show disregard for the rules or you know a certain irreverence for them and um, and I think that that sort of leaves me in a kind of strange sort of hybrid space where I'm not not a filmmaker but I'm not really a filmmaker <laughs> If you know what I mean, something like. Well, give that. us an example of like. Um, that well, e even for example, the fact that uh, you know his identity. If you really follow it forensically, his identity, the name checks, he kind of, they they change it from 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 shot to shot, and and likewise the the tags for the the radio jingles shift, and then there's all sorts of other anomalies in terms of the, 
in terms of the the idea of like consistency. Yeah. And at the same time, he does it all um, as an actor, even though like I give him a script, and and if he if you know when he looks through it, he might realize that his name is changing. But he has a way of sort of, of in terms of how he acts, of kind of just kind of steamrolling over that. Do you know what I mean? Or, so there's or a repressing sort of that coexistence of consistency and inconsistency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a sort of way in which the sort of force of, and part of it is as well. I was thinking of where, as you were just talking earlier, we were talking about this film thing and our, our the, the act of filming, and that there's a type of there is a sort of colonial, there's a sort of colonial spirit to it. There's a way in which, you know, the enterprise of making a film is a type of, uh, is an active kind of, like almost, I don't want to be all melodramatic, but almost kind of violent colonization. You kind of take over an idea and you take over a space and, and, and you kind of, and, and you take what you will from it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's something about that that's, it's almost like a colonial act. Do you know what I mean? In a weird kind of way. And, uh, and anyway, <laughs> I'll leave that hanging. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the, your interest in that particular period of history, like mm -hmm. 60s, 70s, 80s. I yeah. mean, like, it's partly the time when, when you grew up, yeah. but it also slightly, slightly before, um, like the, the yeah. just sure. Oh, <laughs> almost passed or something yeah. like that that, yeah, yeah. that still kind of like has its uh, yeah. lingerings within the, yeah. the time that that you know you grew up in yeah I think for a long time and I don't know if that's actually why you're interested in yeah that. no I think that's a fair I mean I, I don't a hundred percent know myself I think that's a pretty decent uh, guess I mean I think that some of it is that um, Yes, from, from quite early in my practice when I started to work in this way, I was interested in ideas of like the, you know, the recent past or the just past or the idea of like um, how, the, it almost goes back to this kind of surrealist spirit, you know, of the flea market, you know, where, you know, where the, the generative experience of the flea market, where the outmoded, of course, is revelatory. And, and of course, there was a lot of great writing about that in the in the early '90s when I was sort of starting in art school or going through art school, like Rosalind Krauss and and all of this work. And so that was those ideas were you know you know impressed on me and and important. And that that sort of I think that sort of set me on a, a track at some level in terms of a way of working. And then um, but then beyond that, I would say like I think this work. Um, which la which kind of drifts into the 80s and this wasn't uh, this is an observation I've had now about the work it wasn't something that was kind of um, that was that I had when I was it's only a kind of hindsight perspective on the work is that there is a way in which I think you know this idea of the radio broadcast that it, the way it, it broadcast out to a speculative public sphere you know over over the airwaves some sort of like hopeful speculative sp public sphere, uh, that now feels already somehow quite outmoded. Yeah. And it's outmoded, of course, on a technical, uh, technological level in the sense that people stream things and they download podcasts and they have a different way of engaging with media. Um, but also, I think it also at some level, and I, I don't want to overplay this, but there's no doubt about the fact that it sort of echoes the idea of like a general deterioration in the public sphere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. In a, e even in a political sense, right? So you know, if you think about like America in the <coughs> you know in the seventies or eighties, there was some sense of I mean, there was a lot of political divisiveness, but there was also some. I mean, maybe it was a very problematic sense of a public sphere, in the sense that there were certain communities that were clearly marginalized from it. But nonetheless, there was still some sort of a legacy idea of of like you know public space or public sphere. And that just seems to, you know, of course, in the w time we live in now, that just seems to be completely hollowed out, right, as an idea. It just doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, entwined with technology and with the radio. All these things are sort of symptomatic, in a way, of each other, or they, they feed into one another. Well, it's interesting about thinking about DJs in terms of them making the choices for you in terms of what records and what yeah. music they play. And, yeah. you know, obviously also influenced probably by the music industry mm -hmm, in terms sure. of like what are they supposed to play yeah. and all of that but in contrast to uh, today 
like sitting in the car of mm. my parents during mm -hmm. the 70s, yeah. you could, like, you know, they yeah. determined the songs for yeah, you and you sure. listen to them. And yeah. these days, you can just like plug in your iPhone yeah. uh, and have your own playlist yeah. going on. Yeah. And I think that's maybe also mm -hmm. like how there's a change or a shift in what you just said, public's yeah. public sphere and, and yeah. our experience of the world that is now so tailor-made mm -hmm. uh, or that we tailor-made for ourselves. <coughs> it's sort of like a, a curatorialization of reality in that yeah. way. To be uh, constantly having to make all these choices or, you know, we like making these choices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I suppose, I mean, it's funny because the, the, the title of the work in our time at some level is an appeal to that. That it, I actually didn't really arrive at the title via that route of thinking. I arrived at it sort of from a much more circumstantial kind of place. Uh, but, but yeah, it certainly appeals to some idea of a collective time, right, of a time that's shared. And I think in a way that does map back onto the idea of the gallery space. I mean, I guess people in the room here are artists or gallery, you know, uh, people work in galleries or curators or whatever. And, one way or the other, there's an investment. There's some sort of a, uh, an investment in that space, right? We still kind of, at some level, have faith in it. At some level, and and I think it's increasingly under siege, you know. Um, and uh, and I think that part of my project, in general, as an artist, and it's manifest in this work, but it's a more general thing, is does involve kind of. Um, raking over and trying to like rationalize or figure out rationales for for the persistence of that space do you know what i mean yeah yeah especially when you work with as i say like this kind of media art or stuff that sort of uh, it's increasingly the idea of making it to show it in a gallery is an increasingly perverse kind of proposition right i mean the much more likely scenario is that you make it f make something for film festivals or for you know, online, whatever. Do you know what I mean? <coughs> so, so I'm kind of like a luddite. I'm clinging on to, clinging on to that <coughs> gallery space. <laughs> um, one thing that I saw when I was in Münster in terms of the space was also that uh, it created a very intimate atmosphere that almost made you feel like you were sitting right next to the radio announcer or the yeah. DJ there sort of like uh, ex in this little in this little uh, yeah. box and um, when I had conversations with people about the piece most people were focusing on the figure of the of the DJ mm -hmm. and me very few people would mention the other side yeah. of, of the film or yeah. the other side of the radio booth yeah. and I think that had to do with the fact that even now, I'm not 100% sure, and I was just talking with someone about this before, um, are they preparing for a live broadcast, or is this a completely different space where like mm -hmm. a band is setting up to make a radio recording, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. are they going to just like do a rehearsal, or mm -hmm. like uh, that sort of like further complicated the reading of the, of the, of the film to yeah. me. Yeah, I mean that that it, and you kind of wait for them to start. Yeah, you know, and totally. it never happens, and then totally. all of a sudden they pack up the instrument. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny because uh, it's it's of, it's of course exactly it's it's. I mean, uh, my choices were all about uh, making it ambivalent like that or, or ambiguous. Um, I I realized pretty early on it would be. Uh, a relentlessly boring film to make a film just inside that tiny little booth where he uh, where he was um, you know uh, broadcasting from because I just know on a practical level like you know um, if 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 the film is about a guy talking into a microphone <coughs> then what do you cut away to when you need to cut away to something else there has to be some motivation to have another shot and so I've just learned over the years that you have to have a foil. There has to be some sort of counterpoint. There has to be something else yeah. to look at, and then you go back to that. And so that's sort of one kind of almost intuitive kind of, uh, and, and almost an instinctual thing. But beyond that, um, I think that there's like one of the things that's that, that there's a strange sort of dualism that runs through the structure of the film on many levels. So. You have the duality of like him and his space, and the other space, right? And that's and very they never interact. Yeah, there's moments where you can kind of see <coughs> them, where he's kind of seems to be like making signals through the glass uh -huh, to them, uh -huh. and then there's other moments where 
somebody from in there appears to come in here and but there's not a lot of interaction um but um but um so that's partly to do with the way those spaces are sort of architecturally built that they have kind of sound isolated and I always found that really fascinating, the fact that like literally we're this far apart and we just cannot hear one another. It's fantastic engineering, whatever way they do it. And uh, so that was fascinating for me. And this idea of the, pi it's almost like a picture window, you know, so it creates a kind of tableau visible from either side. And then, um, but this duality, so you've got that level of duality, but then you've got another type of duality, which is the fact that you've got those big front speakers in the space, and they essentially, the sound that comes out of them is basically the radio broadcasts, right? So you've got the on-air sound that comes out of them. And then in the speakers that are, sur uh, that are around the periphery of the space, you've got um, essentially the kind of off-air sound in the space. And so you've got a duality there, and, uh, and then you've got, the, I suppose, the third level of it is that you've got this relationship between music and sound. So the musicians kind of make a lot of sound, and it, at these moments where it verges on music, but it reverts to sound then, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then you've got the broadcast, which is very, you know, clearly kind of commercial music. So you've got these kind of structural kind of uh, dualities, you know, that run at different levels through the work, and uh, and there is times, like for example, in the space in in uh, here and listen, where you know when we're installing, where literally you know you've got everything up and running, and I'm there by myself, and I realize like it's really like two soundtracks just playing at the same time in the same space, you know, and uh, and I think that's also like at another level. I kind of think, it, I mean, the sound was all very carefully mixed. I have a guy who's brilliant at doing that. Uh, but there is nonetheless a sort of spirit sometimes when you're a viewer in the space where you have to, as a physical listener, you have to try and reconcile these two almost competing kind of registers of sound. You know, so. I mean, I felt that, um, so you have this band that is trying to, or mm -hmm. well, that's setting up yeah. to play, and they never play, and yeah. then in the end, you sort of like it's a little dissatisfying because yeah. nothing sort of happens, yeah. and kind of like this. It's it's a very absurd gesture yeah. that um, I think you've played with before, yeah, like sure. the idea of like absurdity, <laughs> and yeah. I mean, this is maybe like a very whole uh, low hanging fruit, but yeah. a packet of course comes yeah, to mind. Yeah, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, you're waiting for yeah. someone and he's never showing up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I made another film years ago, a very different film, like a little 16 millimeter film in, in, the, in Copenhagen for a show in the Statens Museum. I made this film about, um, about conservators from the museum um, um, assembling a, a Smithson piece, like a stack of glass, untitled 1968. And I, I shot it, basically what I asked them to do was to, the, the piece was actually on show, I asked them to, to dismantle it, move it and reassemble it. And it's stacks of glass basically with small pieces of stone in between. And so it's a very methodical kind of process. And I filmed both kind of actions and then I cut it together in such a way and it plays back as a loop that it, the work is never either completely disassembled or completely assembled. It's in this perpetual state of sort of in between this. And, uh, and so you know, in many, many ways, like the, the, the dir my kind of dir direction of these, these um, people, the musicians, was, was, is very much copied in a way from that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you, they don't, you don't know if they're actually a, like putting up all this gear or taking it down or maybe they're doing both at different times and, and then what was really funny though with working with them is they're all musicians right so <laughs> you know so they pick up the guy pick, I tell the guy like we're shooting and I say I want you to walk in from this side I want you to walk over there I want you to pick up the guitar move the guitar and sit down and pick up the guitar and then I just want you to play a, couple, a few chords and right? But they just, as soon as they got the guitar in their hands, they just <coughs> wanted to, like, right into Neil Young, you know what I mean? <laughs> just really wanted to, like, do it. I was really like, cut, cut, can we do that again? <laughs> you know, okay. It's quite funny. I mean, it's so it baked in, this, this music thing. I mean, I love it. I admire it, but... Uh, <laughs> 
but I didn't want it. Where did, <laughs> you, shoot it? <laughs> Where did you shoot the film, by the way? I shot it in Dublin, actually. I and shot it in the space that I knew existed, that I, I knew I knew would work. And the actor who's playing the, the radio broadcaster, he is... He's an Irish actor. He's an Irish actor. He's a very good actor. He's a... You know, he's a guy who... Is he like a recognizable figure? Now? Yeah, he, 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 he... Actually, I wasn't so familiar with him, but then when I asked around, I realized he is very well known. He's been... He would have, like, smaller roles in a lot of big movies, for example, and he would be very well known in theater. And, and I have somebody that I've worked with a lot who does casting for me, and uh, both for things in Ireland, but also when I've done things internationally, she's kind of cast stuff for me, so... So, uh, so she kind of led me to him, and uh, and at some level, of course, it was driven by the voice in particular. You know, so you need somebody who can really is really comfortable with voice. They're that type of actor. Yeah. And he also happens to have quite a strong musical background. He doesn't is there's no music. Obviously, he doesn't have any direct involvement here. But I think he's also he's got a kind of a, a pro and, and profile as a certain type of musician. Or he's done like musical theater and stuff like that. So. But that was quite coincidental. So, uh, well, one of your in real key interests is thinking about history. And yeah, we talked about the particular period, and uh, just before our uh, before sitting down, we were talking about like our various mm -hmm. different projects, and um, I was um, saying that I'm once working on a project with uh, Martha Rosler, who is also someone who constantly like mines history yeah. for uh, the creation of her artworks. But unlike her who like, for example, maybe sort of like deals with um, the Cold War or with yeah. the Vietnam War or um, sort of housing projects from the 70s and things like that. You, the, the material that you work with seemingly is m on, on a level seems much more banal. So the yeah. guy's like reading the weather report yeah. and talking about the, the, the rain or the fog yeah. and uh, um, reading a commercial for like yeah. a new car that is yeah. being manufactured. and. Um, it's, so it's a very particular focus that you have on the subjects that you yeah. pick up that are perhaps don't necessarily seem uh, relevant in the sort of larger span of history. They're more sort of like the banal details. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think this was a question. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> you know, I can I can absolutely go <coughs> with that. So yeah, I mean, I think I think well, part of it is is that I'm interested in the idea of at some level, I think I'm drawn to some sense of uh, history as something that's that's bound in material that's a kind of ma that's materialized right so so and by material i mean things like a car advert yeah. right or uh you know um i mean, again that's a little bit like back to the like to be really kind of art historical about it and really kind of refined you talk about as i said the surrealists in the flea market right finding these old objects that speak to uh, some sense of uh, a history uh, that never re that was never fully realized or an al alternative history and and so uh, certainly in a lot of the earlier at the at a earlier evolution of my practice that was a very sort of self-conscious kind of interest and commitment on my part um, I think that uh, I also think in a way um, um, even though I'm very engaged with and have been as you say um, engaged for a long time in questions that can be described as historically kind of as historical in their orientation. There is a sense at some level that, especially, and I think it's very, uh, uh, very palpable in this work that there's a sense of the uh, that there's a there's a sort of pictorialism as well in play. There's a sense of like his, especially in a work like this, history in the sense maybe of history painting, but not necessarily the allegorical kind of mode of history painting, but. But uh, but there's a sense of some play between the pictorial and the historical. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that's that's a way in which you know I um, that's a way in which I think I you know, it's a space. I think I've, I I I work in more so in some works than others. Uh, beyond that, I would say that. Um, um, I'm interested as well in. I mean, what's it's funny because for me, it's it's I, I'm very uh, I'm quite concerned with kind of structural questions about art and about the the role of art and how art sits, the necessity of art at a, at a given moment, 
And I think that um, I think that there's a way in which you know that at some level for me precludes the possibility of um, of being kind of overly kind of discursively engaged. I think I have to find a kind of I mean I think art of the last ten or fifteen years has been a lot of work that I love, the work that I think is great, that whole part of art that I'm interested in, that's been in very engaged with questions like of the archive or of, you know, uh, historical discursivity and, and, you know, stuff that Martha Rosler would be like a cardinal figure for, like she would be a kind of patron saint, so to speak, of, of all those interests, right, and would have opened that up for everybody that came after. Um, but I think I'm also aware of the fact that art has, I've come to realize that art has a complicated and troubling relationship with information at some level, and with the idea of information and discourse, and that and maybe this is turning me into an old school modernist, but I, I do think that in a way there's a specificity to the realm of art that, that also precludes it from, from, from being journalism, for example, or being history. It can't be that even if it wants to be that. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. I remember there was this, um, well, uh, I mean, th there's this kind of very famous quote by uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres that he said, like, I don't want to make art about subjects that I can read an about in the yeah, newspaper. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Which would sort of like go against actually uh, Martha's work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though Felix was a student of Martha. Sure, yeah, yeah. You yeah. sort of like can yeah, see yeah. the evolution there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and I think, in a way, you know, now, you know, we, we live in this, this we're, we're, we're coming to terms with this internet reality that we live in, and we're slowly coming to terms with it. I think, I think our thinking is way behind our empirical experience yeah, of it. Yeah. And I think that, um, but I think one of the things that's, that's happened is that, you know, um, information and the access to, like, historical information and archives, that's exploded, of course, right? And so you have like uh, whole <laughs> tranches of artistic practice that are reactive to that and responsive to that, and and that's all stuff. I mean, I find it compelling in the way that it's you know it's all compelling. But also, as I say, I just think that there's a sort of resistance there. There's a level at which, you know, I, I realize I can't go too far down that path. I'm, at some level, I'm stuck at the level of the. I don't want to sound too formalist, but there's a way in which I am stuck at the level of the image. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think also the, the fusion of these different time periods that, that we talked about mm -hmm. is, is uh, not only revealed through the um, actual dialogue or yeah. the presentation, but also through the kind of bringing together of all the different mm -hmm. visual elements. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And which sort of brings me to this t incredibly detailed setup of, of, of your films yeah. and meticulously I mean like every single detail is completely sought through yeah. and like even the writing on the tapes <laughs> uh, when you like look very carefully yeah. you know it's yeah, yeah. like specific yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Um, th th that uh, um, attention to detail just is staggering to me yeah well I mean I, I have to give a lot of credit to the crew that I work <laughs> with <laughs> I'll take credit for hiring the right people. For the <laughs> 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 but you're sort of like the, 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 the task master who yeah, makes sure course. that all of those elements are actually yeah, in place. Yeah, of course. Pe people come to you and they say, is this important or not? And you tell them if you think it's important or not. Yeah. And some things you say, no, that's not important. And other things you say, no, 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 that's really important. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so at some level, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I set a tone, you know, uh, in terms of working with people. but. Uh, I, I've also, I mean, actually, the, the woman who did all the, the sort of set, the, the real work on the set on this is somebody that I hadn't worked with before. She's young, great, I'll totally work with her again. She was, it was a great find. But uh, a lot of the people that I work with, I've, I've done multiple productions with them. And they're just people who, yeah, who, who, who you know, you trust, and also people who, come, who you feel come to know what's important, I, I feel they come to know what's important to me, do you know what I mean, in terms of a production, yeah, so that's yeah. why I go back to them, you know what I mean. You were talking about the archives and mining archives mm -hmm. and looking into archives and, um, you know, from my own research I know that there are certain periods where there's more material there and people didn't necessarily have this um, 
obsession with archiving and yeah. documenting everything yeah. the way that we do it now. Like yeah. even this talk is filmed, and I wonder, I if, like, if anybody's ever going to look at that. I Maybe know. some sort of <laughs> PhD <laughs> student on yeah. Jupiter who yeah, one yeah. day will write about your work. Maybe yeah, yeah. might watch this film, but uh, yeah. apart from her or him, yeah. uh, probably nobody. <laughs> ever I know it's <laughs> it's so funny. You know, I have to say when we came in here this morning and there was just a few of us here and there was the camera there I had this feeling I was like this is a bit like we're about to film like we're about to yeah. shoot something it's like yeah we've got the crew <coughs> here this, the five of us are here we're having our coffee we're gonna start now in five minutes it just had a also because the space kind of an odd, slightly yeah, odd yeah, yeah. it's a great space but kind of odd I really felt like we're about to shoot something which we, I guess we are at some level so. <laughs> No, but I just b wanted to like, s yeah. hear your opinion about like why is it is it just because of technical development that we have the ability it's to document things easier now, yeah. or is it just like that our mindset has changed and that we feel like we need to document everything now, rather than like let's say in the sixties or fifties, um, where it's it's, it's stifling, it's right? Like a sort it of like yeah. ideological shift in in terms yeah. of how we think about ourselves as uh, as civilization. I think that in some ways, you know, if I, if we, you know, can, we kind of lapse into sort of psychoanalyzing it, you know, you'd have the sense that uh, uh, that this this means of production, i.e., the camera here, right, um, which is relatively newly available to us, right, um, is um, so we deploy it because uh, because it sort of speaks to it seems to like uh, it seems to be a response to some anxiety we have right uh, so there's different levels to the anxiety this whole social media tier right which is about like you know kind of spreading the news or whatever or connecting you know connectivity uh, there's also some other level which is you know historicist right and I think that's also very very alive now I mean. Um, uh, Listen just published this incredible book, which is like 50 years of the gallery, which is like, it's like two phone books together, right? It's <laughs> like this thick, you know? And, and at some level, phone I mean, it's book? what's a phone? A book? phone? <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. I thought that as I was saying it. Like, um, but um, uh, yeah, so, you know, there's a sort of historicist, and that's all, I think, of course, they're all entwined. Um, but I think. Uh, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of generating this material in the way that we generate garbage. You know? <laughs> 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 or Where is it all going? Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's like too much packaging, you know? <laughs> and, uh, like, it's interesting when you were talking about Martha earlier and talking about how, like, so little of the history is really kind of chronicled or archived or documented. And, and now, literally, every text message you send, somebody's recording it, right? We know that. So, uh, so we, we really live in a, a very, very different kind of reality. And I just, as I say, as a general sort of observation, I think we, um, our understanding of, of, of the sort of technological implications, the technological reality we live in is way behind the experience we have, you know, or like there's such a lag in terms of our cultural understanding of it. Um, and I think it'll, yeah, it'll take 10 or 20 years before we, we're even close, yeah. you know. Um. But the idea of archiving um, also for me always meant that we sort of like had uh, access to the idea of like where we are coming from, no? Like yeah. this is like our history yeah. and it helped to shape our identity. Yeah. Like it gave us comfort yeah. because we kind of had this a past that we could like say, okay, this is where where housings had to be de developed, and um, it gave us a sense of who we are. And, and yeah, I think I, it's funny because I'm I'm sort of even the last few days here in New York. I mean, yesterday I went to the Whitney to see the Jimmy Durham show and just to see a little bit of the Whitney or whatever, and just just kind of that act of switching from kind of the production mentality of installing a show to to me it's quite a different mentality where I'm going around looking at shows, right? And start to think about art in a different way again. I start to think about it in, in, in these kind of, you know, we'll say like the, the bigger, broader cultural terms. And, and there is a sense, you do get the sense that, um, that, you know, without being too 
a polemic in my thinking. There is a sense that, like, you know, this culture is, is a real challenge to our ideas, some, to, to, to some of our ideas of art, especially art in relation to the museum and art in relation to, like, some idea of history or the archive, right? Uh, you know, with, with the kind of this whole sort of social media kind of, kind of schizophrenia that people coexist in multiple spaces simultaneously. Uh, that idea of, uh, of the specificity of a practice, when you think about, it's maybe, I don't know if it's fair that we're talking about Martha's work here, but, but to take that as like it's an emblematic example, like, uh, um, and, and, you know, and, and the period, you know, I would say that the period of Martha's pra practice is also a period that I was a student in, you know, and I grew up in, so to speak, and so therefore was very formative for me. So I see it as, as kind of a touchstone, in a way, for, for who I am as an artist. But there's no doubt about the fact that, uh, that, it, that, 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 there's no doubt about the fact that actually that kind of moment, that specificity of that moment, and in a way, the kind of scarcity of it, uh, it feels like very kind of outmoded now. I mean, you know, I, I went to graduate school in New York, here in New York in the mid-90s, and I lived in New York through the late 90s, the end of the 90s. And, and so, you know, when I'm back here now, I realize, like, you know, that's a lifetime ago at some level in terms of, like, for example, the artistic in life of the city, you know. Uh, I mean, when I got here first, everything was in Soho, you know, and then it started to ebb towards Chelsea at the end of the 90s. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when it was in Soho, you still had a very palpable sense of, of the 70s in art. In the, even if it was the mid-90s, you still had a palpable sense of the 70s, 60s and 70s. There was still an idea that you might be visiting, like, um, Zwerner Gallery when it was on Green Street, and that somehow, you know, for all, you, you might see, like, like buzzers, like, and you realize that's, that some artist had a loft upstairs. Do you know what I mean? Uh, that they'd maybe had for 20 years at that point. Yeah. And so, so of course, that's, that's completely washed away, and that's, that's you know, I mean, I, I, hate, I don't want to sound kind of, Reverend, overly nostalgic, but but I just think I just think like in a palpable way. Like I think the archive, the the mediation, all of this is partly a kind of a um, you know a, a seems like a, a slightly desperate response to like a, a a changing reality that's just like a tidal wave overwhelming us. And and I don't think we, my sense is that we have we don't fully understand the implications yet of of that. I mean, even I was talking to somebody yesterday who's a. Uh, a gallerist, not from this and somebody else, just, you know, who's kind of like a, somebody I didn't know very well, but he deals with prints, you know, it's kind of a separate field to mine, but he was just saying, like, oh, disastrous times, there's no collectors anymore, or whatever, like, it's just a different reality, you know, people, everything is, he told me that if people ask him for images of prints, he waits till the end of the day to send them the JPEGs, because he's worried if he sends them earlier in the day, that they'll just review it on their phone and decide if they want to work it or not. Whatever, you know, so. Well, one thing that came to my mind um, recently that I've discussed with friends a lot is that um, I think this is really like a moment in time um, where for the first moment um, I feel like a reg regression in sort of like our uh, desire to sort of create a world that's sort mm -hmm. of more humane and more equal in terms mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's like closing income gaps or mm -hmm. like dismantling patriarchy and mm -hmm. things like that and, and like it's almost regressive and um, so like looking back in history to a moment when like these utopias or mm -hmm. these ideas were still, uh, still alive uh, mm -hmm. seems something, it uh, seems like something that a lot of artists I think from your generation particularly sort of like seem to to do it's almost like a there was a golden age at yeah. some point of like art making back in the <coughs> late 60s or early yeah. 70s and now that's all gone mm -hmm. you know yeah I, I absolutely and I, I think um, I suppose uh, yeah and as I said about this work you know there's a way in which it evokes some sense of like um, a public sphere for example, that you could appeal to, 
some sort of like uh, social democratic, maybe not, that's too strong a term, but like some sense of like a publis, you know, and it's interesting because you talked earlier about the experience of seeing the work in Munster and I was there at the opening and then I went back the last weekend of the show, uh, which was the beginning of, end of September, beginning of October. Just wanted to see the work again before I was in installed it here. And, uh, and of course the last weekend was also a busy weekend, like the first weekend. So, uh, so it was busy. I went into this little small space where the work is shown and it was full of people and it was kind of like shoulder to shoulder and you know it was really interesting to to just look at how the how this sort of sphere how this space worked um, like this as a communal space because the work has like as it was installed there there's like a big doorway that's like the swivel doorway that's that sort of you enter via from the main library and essentially like the door needs to be closed but people have to use the door to get in and out. So then there's this kind of whole process of regulating the opening and closing of the door, right? And it was really interesting to see how, you know, there was this kind of communality amongst the people in the space about managing the door. Do you know what I mean? Which was really interesting to me, actually. It was a sense that like, people are shoulder to shoulder looking at the work and they're kind of also managing the door. and and and. Um, you know, in a way, I mean, I, to talk about Munster, as I said, like in a way, what I loved about the show, one of the things I loved about it is that it does seem to like be embedded in like a 60s, 70s German social democratic kind of moment, right? Uh, some sense that, that art was good for the whole, for the public, and it should be available to all the public, right? There was all, all those kind of spirits, you know, and, and ethics in play. And it felt, it, I mean, one of the things that I in really enjoyed about the, the, the sculpture project in general is it felt like that that was still somehow a principle that was kind of alive, right? And that's increasingly rare. There was a time when it was commonplace, now it feels rare. And I felt like this moment in the library really manifested that, you know? And also, in a way, it sort of reminds me, maybe as a final footnote, it, it sort of reminds me of my parents talking about when they were children like in the you know, in the 40s right and you know or in the even in the 50s as you know teenagers or whatever where you know they there was no TV people didn't have TVs right so there'd be one TV so like if there was some famous sporting event the whole neighborhood would crowd into somebody's house to watch that TV to watch some boxing match or whatever it was and and um, and so, it, in a way, the, the moon sitting was a little bit like that somehow. So, it's just kind of nice. Well, I have maybe two or three <laughs> more questions, and then we can open up to the audience. Um, how much, like, what's, wh what is the difference for you showing a work like this within this kind of context of, of, uh, of an exhibition that takes place over entire city mm -hmm. versus showing it, like, because you mentioned the Whitney, showing it within a museum setting? Yeah. Is 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 like the, the the sculpture project just sort of like a dismantled museum, but it's still an institution that just exists in many different places, or is there really a, a difference? In terms I mean, of I, like I, I think I think I think uh, of course, um, if you really want to, if you it depends on what level you you know you want to engage the question. I mean, um, you know, of course, I think when you really like. How, like refine your analysis it's quite different at some level uh, I think at the level of you know people who work in museums curators directors it's a different proposition of course um, it's probably more akin to a festival or something um, uh, for me on the kind of working premise as an artist um, it's not so different um, I have this idea that I still hang on to the idea maybe it's naive of me, but I still hang on to the idea that the museum is a kind of public space, right? And, uh, and so, um, and maybe that's a type of utopianism on my part, but I, I do kind of hang on to that. And so to show the work in that context is, is in a way to make it available to a public. Um, you think that the threshold of going into a museum is <coughs> stronger than the one uh, in, in, Münster. In, in Münster? I Apart think from the struggle of even finding the piece. Which is like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, 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 yeah. well, I think I think it's I think it's a good question. I think um, I think that really I think 
in practice, probably the museum is, a, the threshold is probably stronger. But I think it really, that's where you get into questions of how museums engage their, their publics, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So I think one of the things that's really successful about Munster is that, the, is that there's a very strong sense that the people of Munster feel like they own the sculpture project and that they are entitled to see the sculpture project. And, uh, and so, and that of course speaks to a whole other kind of cultural, social values systems, yeah. right? Uh, whereas, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of times museums are struggling to kind of what outreach, but actually it's, it's reflective of like much more profound kind of political, cultural, social values, right? The, di the, the pro you know, the problems, you know. Uh, a lot of communities don't feel like, of course they don't feel like the museum is a place that addresses them or yeah, is for yeah. them or is accessible to them. And, and uh, So in that sense, in practice, yes, it's a different situation. But I do think in a way to, to, to take that question sort of, for example, back to the work, I do think there's a sense, I mean the work kind of enacts these, some of these kind of questions yeah. about the public sphere. and and and. and and also the idea of like, you know, it's a pretty kind of mellow soundtrack. It's a pretty mainstream, like middle of the road kind of 80s, 70s, 80s kind of soundtrack. And, and there's a way in which that's kind of almost displaced as a ready-made into the museum yeah. to see if that also at some level has a place in the museum. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Which it does and it doesn't, you know. Uh, and so, so that's a, that's, there's definitely a gesture in that, you know. Um, so, well, maybe my last question, which mm -hmm. was something that's been on my mind um, since we started uh, the conversation, and I just didn't get around to ask you that, is how much of the of his um, delivery there is scripted, and how much did you actually take from original uh, radio broadcasts? Well, it is. And a how did you make the selection for yeah, the music that he's playing? It's a it's a good, they're really good, detailed question. So. Um, the script was formulated from a lot of the script is taken from I listened to lots and lots of old radio broadcasts and and so I plucked out like little tropes little sort of motifs or tropes or jingles or just things that were interesting to me and culled them from these and then and then basically what I did was I I formulated little sort of um, you know maybe one two minute kind of scenarios you know uh, and then, um, funnily enough, there was no, as I said, there was no real attempt to reconcile to them all together to make something super smooth and consistent. I recognized from listening to radio that there's something, and this is actually probably an important part of the work, there's something about radio that's actually deeply schizophrenic about the way that it works. There's something about the way the broadcast flits from one thing to another and, and it lives literally, I mean, we're talking about history, but the ra radio really lives in the moment, right? In the moment of its liveness, right? There's a type of actuality that's very, very important to, 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 to it's, it stumbles from moment to moment, literally. And, um, and that was, that's actually a really important idea for me uh, because um, I think I wasn't really interested in a work when we talk about how long the work is and all that, and I wasn't really interested in a work that had a kind of, uh, that you could experience in a kind of compositional sense, kind of where you see a whole thing, you see it from beginning to end. Like for me, the, the structure of the work is really, as I said, based on pattern. And that really, because radio really works on pattern. You know, you turn on the radio at an arbitrary time and you turn it off at an arbitrary time. You don't, you, there's, no com there's no completeness to your encounter with it. And that's why I was drawn to radio as a as a form. Um, and the pattern idea, as I said to somebody in the last few days, it's it's like wallpaper in a way. The, the the work has a structure kind of of wallpaper. You arbitrarily cut in and cut out at a certain point to make a piece of wallpaper, and that in itself has a has a form even despite the arbitrary in and outs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's really the antithesis of, for example, film film, right? Which you know, which is very kind of complete and very succinct in its form, and and so so. Um, you want to see the? Do you want the audience to see your film from beginning to the end? No, no. That's a to me in terms of the Does work. That that's a kind of nonsensical kind of. That's a nonsensical kind of. Um, 
it doesn't make sense to me as a proposition because the work is very much built on this, as I say, this radio idea and this idea. To fully understand the film or any of your other works, I feel if I just take a glimpse, I'm not really getting it. It's like if I go to uh, MoMA and I just and I look at a, just like a corner of a painting, yeah. I just don't get the full picture. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but for me, it's like, it's, it's like the, the, to take it into art historical terms, I mean, uh, I've had a long-standing interest in, in minimalism, and I've made work about minimalism. So, so to, to, to paraphrase Judd, Donald Judd, he talked about the idea of artistic composition, like composition as an outmoded kind of art, art, artistic question. For him, composition was an old school European hangover. What he was interested in was the idea of um, of seriality and modularity, right? And uh, and so um, and in a way, and and, and the and the great art, the great art historical referent for Judd and Carl Andre, for example, was like Brancusi, Brancusi's endless cult, right? And and there is a way in which this work in a way, borrows the form of Brancusi's endless column. It doesn't really matter where it begins or ends. You know, you, you encounter it at a certain point, and, and in a way, as a, as a viewer, you have to extract yourself from it at another point. And, and, and I think that actually that's quite, um, I had no, I mean, that, they were ideas that I had in mind when I was formulating. These are the ideas that were kind of driving my interest in the project. I had no w way of verifying if people would actually experience the work in that way, and I can't say categorically that people do experience in that way. But one thing that I can say, just from feedback from talking to people, is that nobody really knows when they're meant to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so in that sense, at some level, I think it, it, those ideas that I had did translate into the work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, s I walked into the space just some some point, yeah. and then just watched it one cycle, yeah. and I realized, okay, like, okay yeah. now this is the beginning again, yeah. you know, then I, I saw it one more time, but um, yeah. I could not think of, like, I mean, I couldn't, I, I would never think of your work in relationship to minimalism, that's like... Uh, it's f it's it's <laughs> like a, oh can you see it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, you know it's maybe talked about the details and everything. It's just like it's sort of I like know. A, maybe like a, a kind of baroque minimalism or something. Oh, yeah, like I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> Donald Judd would have hated it. But anyway, <laughs> well, why don't we open it up to some questions from the audience? Yeah. So I have a question. I I liked the way that you used. I like the way that in the beginning, um, Jerry, you use perversion over and over again. I feel like we're getting a bit of a perversion right now because we're watching what is over your head silently and in a very short loop. Yeah. And of course, that's quite different from the experience when you're inside the work. And I experienced it the other night at the opening. And I feel like seeing it silently, it's almost as if a lot of the time stamps that you know are part of radio have dropped out. Yeah. And I'm also, I mean, I'm of your generation. I was kind of curious that you use colonial as opposed to Cold War. I mean, Jens brought up Cold War, but you really spoke to colonial. I see it so much as like Cold War generation right. and the sort of time stamping of news as it's delivered on the radio. The news does speak of, you know, um, Reagan and um, uh, Brezhnev. Brezhnev, yeah, Brezhnev. Brezhnev, yeah. Brezhnev. Right? Brezhnev, yeah. Brezhnev. Up, you know, <laughs> before Gorbachev, and I kept wanting, when I was sitting as an audience member, sort of trapped in that moment of not knowing when I could escape, not knowing if the performers were ever going to perform, but wanting to hear the news of Gorbachev. Anyway, what I really want you to talk about is the perversion of us right now, sitting here, watching it on the short le loop, not hearing the voice, not hearing the timestamps, not hearing about the Camaro as yeah. opposed to the Nissan or Toyota. Yeah. And what we're losing as the perversion of being audience members seeing it silent. <laughs> <laughs> um. Because to some extent, I think that this will someday end up in the way that this is a media 
that we were never supposed to see because it was happening behind the scenes in the 1970s, 80s yeah. in, a, in a sound studio. I think you guys are going to end up on the internet and the audience someday will be so much larger than what we are in this room. You know, my students will be able to watch this over and over again, trying to parsing out so they can write papers okay. about what you're saying. Well, so I think you're gonna. On the record, this Sunday morning, I was at the birthday party <laughs> yesterday <laughs> till 2 a.m. <laughs> Good, you get that in there. <laughs> I also have my excuses. <laughs> um, well, I think in a way, I, if I understand what you're asking, uh, Kathleen, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a sense in which, you know, um, like this a scenario actually comes out of my own teaching experience on a practical level. I you know, often, when I was teaching, I don't teach now, but when I was teaching, I would um, get, we'd, we'd be looking at work, students' work or whatever, video works or whatever, and we'd watch it through, and then we'd put it on in the like playing like this, turn down the sounds, so you could talk over it. And it was I found it actually a really productive like you could you could it gives you all sorts of visual triggers. You recall what it is you're talking about. It's a way of kind of having it manifest in the space, but allowing us to speak over it. So that's a very that was a very pragmatic gesture this morning. But beyond that I would say that um uh yeah, at some level, you know, there's an awareness that, you know, that the work has a physical character to it that's you know I talked a little bit about it earlier the the freestanding screen but also at another level like these big speakers and this big sound uh, is extremely physical in terms of how you experience it and it's meant to work in a very physical way so so and, and so I'm wary of the fact of trying to for me I'm kind of wary of the fact of misrepresenting of losing those aspects of, of the work in a, in a misrepresentation in a situation like this, for example. Um, and so, and for example, like I have a general rule of thumb with, with, with my work that I don't show it in like festivals or in uh, kind of, I generally don't show it in screening situations unless it's a scenario like this where, where there's talk or it's a, you know, and then, and then I might show, for example, Ten minutes of a wit sound or whatever, and then do a talk. Do it. I'm pragmatic about it on that level, but, but I'm aware of the fact that actually, you know, there's a level of misrepresentation in, and 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 it, and it's also something that's that's very difficult to avoid because we live again. We live in this era now where everything supposedly can be posted everywhere and translated from one form to another, and and that's an expectation now. So. So at some level, I'm kind of trying to negotiate that in terms of my approach. I mean, I mean the film that we have here, like we have no sound. The, the light is sort of yeah washed you know, out. We have a yeah. shadow there, yeah. and it's just a, a, you kind of like took the film apart to a degree yeah. where it's really not the film anymore. Yeah. So you can actually be uh, have peace of mind about like this this thing that this isn't in any shape form the yeah. experience that, that the film has yeah, yeah. And, and and in a way like you know I mean although as I said earlier I'm kind of like uh, you know I kind of flirt with this kind of practice of, of, of making films right I mean I use the tools of film production uh, and a lot of the aesthetics of film production uh, and all of that but but my formation really is, is I really come out of art. I went to art school. I, I have an MFA in sculpture, <laughs> <laughs> and for what it's worth. And, uh, and, th and that's where I come out of. And I very much, you know, the, uh, that's still at some level very much the context for my thinking. It's partly why I'm, so, I'm still attached to the gallery as a space, and, and actually why I've Despite the, the, the many suggestions over the years that like, oh, you should make a feature, or you should like, you know, you should, you know, make a film, you know, because I'm working with actors and scripts and cinematographers and all the kind of paraphernalia of film production, I haven't really done that. Um, I'm not saying that I wouldn't do it. It's not a kind of point of principle, but I haven't, you know, I, I just haven't found my way into that. Do you know what I mean? And this makes much more sense to me still, you know. Well, it's an interesting point. Um, mm -hmm. When I look at artists that have made that step, mm -hmm. and one artist in particular that comes to mind is Steve McQueen. Mm -hmm. 
where when you see, let's say, 12 Years a Slave, yeah. and you go to Marion Goodman and you see a film that he's made in for that context, mm -hmm. they couldn't be further away. Sure. Um, that was something that really struck me. Yeah. Uh, in his case, yeah. how far um, the gap is. In, like with other artists who've made that step, that uh, gap is much, much closer. Yeah. And you can still realize. Yeah. And um, when they premiered 12 Years a Slave um, at the New York uh, Film Festival mm -hmm. two or three years ago, <coughs> I, I, I spoke to some of the actors and asked them whether or not they actually knew that Steve McQueen was... Uh, an artist. Come, comes out of the you know art world and makes his other films, and they had no clue. Yeah, you know they didn't know. Yeah, which I thought was also interesting, interesting that Steve would not tell them. Yeah, that this is where he comes from, and maybe that war could inform them about who they're actually dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I from I mean, I think Steve McQueen is the, it obvious. It seems it seems very obvious that he's the person, the person who's done it extremely well. Uh, a lot of other people, I think, for a, for a lot of other people, it's been a, a very checkered kind of yeah. uh, transition, and uh, um, so so it's it's yeah it, it's it's uh, this is all part I think as well symptomatic of this bigger, broad question we talked about earlier, which is like like means of production is increasingly less an issue, you know. Uh, the, the, but, but what's increasingly the issue is, is how we understand these things and how we find places for ourselves and, and f how we find necessity in this, you know, because at some level I think art has to be, there has to be a, a, a sense of necessity in terms of art making, yeah, yeah. you know, I think that's, that's uh, I think that, that grounds things at some level, you know, I mean even the, you know, you go to an artist's studio and there's a sense of, you know, it, it, it has to be, Tied to some physicality, some, some, uh, and and uh, you know, and I think that artists, you know, it's it's a weird set of kind of demands. Maybe it's not something that's exclusive to to demands of being an artist, but I do think artists have to be able to think in a kind of micro macro way. You know, they have to. There has to be the macro kind of overview. You have to have some sense of how your work fits into history and how your work fits into current you know concerns and at the same time so you can't be clueless about that stuff and at the same time I have a sense that it has to be driven by the particularity of like very idiosyncratic sets of interests and, and you somehow have to be able to hold both those concerns in your head at the same moment and, um, and I think that you know what I mean somebody like Steve McQueen like those of us who of course, know the work through the galleries, right, and have some sense of what his concerns are. Then, when you see the feature films, we can see those concerns in the feature films, right? We can see how I can feel it when I look at his features. I can see how the previous work, the art artwork, is fed has fed into those productions, even though undoubtedly, you know, it's at such a kind of um, sort of underground level. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That it's lost on most of the people directly involved in the production. I mean, this isn't really yeah. a talk about Steve McQueen, but um, I could see that uh, uh, in Hunger, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> but every time he makes another film, he moves further and further and further away from Maybe so. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. I like talk thing, about other artists. <laughs> the other thing, maybe also to 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 what you were saying in in response to that uh, that that and now through this conversation kind of comes to mind is we talked about like how you uncover something that's otherwise not visible, like you mm -hmm. see the a DJ booth of a radio broadcaster, and um, you never really are specific about political events mm -hmm. that obviously during that period that you cover mm -hmm. were plentiful mm -hmm. and. Um, we all have like an experience of that time in some shape or form. I felt extremely comfortable f looking at the film, extremely comfortable. And maybe it is because it sort of like goes back to uh, my childhood too and the associations that uh, come up when he makes certain announcements mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like how I experienced the world back in the 70s or 80s. And so there was like an extreme sense of comfort. May, maybe that's is that, is that what a good thing? Like. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, back to the womb or something. I don't know. It's uh, um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Actually, I really don't I know. Did anybody I, else experience this, this sense of comfort? <laughs> sure. 
Yeah, I'm curious, Jared, you've seen audiences react to it. How do people who are half your age react to yeah, it? That's a really good question. Uh, but it's funny, I had my, my, uh, my niece was there at the opening. She's, uh, she's a sort of a um, sophomore in Sarah Lawrence. So she came down for the opening. And she's sort of interested. She's not a filmmaker. She's sort of doing you know lots of different things. But but she well I don't know maybe it's just because she's my niece. She loved it, right? <laughs> 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 but she's a very smart like nineteen year old. So uh, and it's certainly not of of her era. Probably her father, my brother in law. Like she's probably used to hearing this music like droning around the house, you know, because it's his kind of it's his kind of soundtrack. I'd say you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's a really good question, and I think... Um, well, obviously, you can enter the films through many, many different yeah. ways. So like that, uh, you know, is like one way of like entering it, but then there's also many other ways that I feel like are protect, you know, of, yeah. of our time yeah. to just like uh, go back to the title. But I do think, I do think maybe just to, to come back, like, with, uh, like one of the things that I learned from, from doing the research for the project and listening to a lot of old radio broadcasts is that we have this we have this idea that music is very um, that this music is very kind of time specific that it's sort of from a period or whatever and then and we tend to kind of we tend to archive music in in the way that we archive other things and we tend to be quite regulatory about about the, the about its set of references but the reality of it is it's like if you listen to like a radio broadcast from 1980 you're as likely to hear Frank Sinatra as you are to hear uh, Led Zeppelin. Do you know what I mean? If you pan across the, the spectrum of, of, of what was commercial radio at that point, do you know what I mean? And I'm sure you, the same similar set of rules would apply today. You know? So that's actually something that I think is really interesting about the radio and about, about um, about is, I mean, as I said, my starting point for this project was this idea of the radio as a kind of model of time. Uh, and, um, and there is a weird way in which it, it's a very complex idea of temporality is enacted across the radio that's not at all linear and not at all kind of neatly archivable. And that's one of the things that's really interesting about it. So even, even the implication that somehow this music is somehow of our broad generation you know, is is actually up for debate. You know, I don't know if we can actually make that assumption. Yeah. Well, I think if if the if the movie itself is like it function as a clock because of the weather reports and then the hourly chimes and the news and stuff, and then you take the elements of being a wallpaper, you step in and step out, which subverts it as a clock, mm -hmm. and then you have the the pops that are from different eras and you mess it around a little bit with the radio programming, mm -hmm. the song programming, to which extent do you use this element of subverting or sabotaging your own clock uh, as a sign of the times or as a reference to what we're experiencing now? I think, I think there's a way in which, you know, you know, in terms of the form of the, the, the radio broadcast, it's quite, it's quite, um, it's not so clever in terms of how I put it together. It's quite basic. It's quite mimetic, like in a very sort of loose way. It's sort of mimetic of like a radio broadcast of you know at least the, the, the of the ones I was listening to. Um, I think that because um, they they were quite variable. There's certain things that are consistent. There's always an anxiety about time, referencing time during the broadcast, and you know so that's a motif. That, that of course I've made use of it made sense for me, uh, but um, but I think that my I think in a way like my the gesture of of the work for me th it isn't about kind of subverting radio. I don't know if that's what you're suggesting, but subverting it's time as a clock, like making a, a, a contrast between what time was then, maybe how it was structured because life was different, and then now our times are. Uh, Mm -hmm. have less base or less grounded in time because we consist, as you say, in different moments, in different times. Yeah. We step in and out of programs and we have this uh, multiplicity of identity. Yeah. And so how, how uh, to which extent do you use that purposely here 
subverting the idea of structured time in the movie as a, as a reflection of our lives now. As I would well, well, maybe uh, maybe my sense of it is is that actually the the movie is 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 very uh, very much uh, the, the work very much enforces a structure an idea of structured time, right? Because because there's a sense because apart from anything else is this there's this thing that it plays back in real time, right? So there's a way in which it binds itself to the actual time of day that, that you, as a viewer, encountered in the space. And so that there's, there's a way in which that's an act of regulation in both directions, right? The work is regulated by the reality of, like, the time of day. And, you know, I had to make, we had to come up with a technical kind of solution that would make that work. So that's a kind of a binding of the work to the time of day. Uh, and then, uh, on the other hand, you as a viewer, you know, I think when you encounter the work, there's a sense in which, there's a sense in which, yeah, that, that, that sort of regulation also kind of maps onto your, temp your, your, the time you spend in the space, right? So there's a, there's a sort of governing or regulating in play, you know, through the work. And, and that itself appeals to a little bit like the radio broadcast, it appeals to some sense of like uh, of our time as a collective, right, or a communal thing, which is sounds like a very unremarkable uh, concept, but actually it's an increasingly, yeah, it's an increasingly kind of uh, fractured concept. Do you know what I mean? The sense of our time in a communal in a communal idea. So. So the work very much kind of, you know, there's, there's a, I think that's a very central gesture in the work, that sense of, it comes back to the spirit of kind of making that sort of very basic spirit of making visible something that's, that's maybe latent but is not so visible. Right? Well, one of the things that we might be, maybe are not really even aware of anymore because we've gotten so used to, to see film mm -hmm. in exhibition contexts mm -hmm. is the fact that film in itself has like subverted and um, <coughs> very much um, like changed the way that we, we sort of think and view art. Yeah. Like if I would go to see this film, um, I, I, m m it would be m very unlikely that I would always come at exactly the at the same time. I always come at a different yeah. moment. Whereas when I go into a gallery that shows more traditional, mm. like you mentioned Donald Judd, yeah. the Judd is always the same Judd sure. no matter when I go to the museum. Yeah. You know, and in that way, um, film in itself has like uh, subverted the experience of going to, to, to a museum. And there are ideas that are, you know, very, very central to the way I think about what I'm doing, actually. Those, exactly those sets of concerns, like, uh, and, uh, and, you know, for the simple reason that I have to, at some level in my own mind, reconcile those things in order to be able to make work. The making work is at some level a gesture of trying to reconcile those types of anomalies, and so. Um, well, you before said like you were not interested in making a feature film, mm -hmm. and obviously there you have a beginning and an end in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I would like think of your work as very cinematic. Yeah, like it's sort of like a cinema for exhibitions rather yeah. than a cinema for a cinema. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I've got a lot of things I haven't worked out yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. Yeah, sure. You, you have to have something to work on, right? I figured it all out. <laughs> yeah. and I, and I just keep going, doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely.